tell you is that Vermont was the first state to abolish slavery. And over the years, they've really polished this reputation. But beneath the surface uh, existed racism that many have chosen to ignore. Maudine, Maudine Neal exposed this undercurrent in her talk about the Ku Klux Klan in Vermont. So I hope you enjoy her presentation, which is a very thorough one, and it has many pictures and many relics from the days uh, of, the, of the Ku Klux Klan type in the 20s. So without further ado, Maudine Neal of Franklin Street in Montpelier is going to speak. We're going to do a PowerPoint first. And I will get the process of the pictures. Now, first I want to tell you the cover of the book was designed by Wesley Herwig. Anybody here know Wesley Herwig? He lived in Randolph and had a little printing shop. And he published the book. And he designed the the cover. And here we go. Did it move? Yes. yes. <laughs> what was the Ku Klux Klan? Did any of you know that ahead of time? Do you know what it was? Yeah. yeah. What was it? The Ku Klux Klan, it was a anti, it was a racist organization that believed white supremacy was uh, a belief that they followed. Okay. And uh, this one. If you go ahead and show the next one. So I don't see very well. <laughs> Trying to get so I can see it. So people thought they were protecting themselves. People thought they were protecting themselves from from the Hello, hello, hello. How does it turn on and off? Can you hear it? No. No. Well, I didn't touch it. There, try that. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Can you see that? Okay. It was started by Nathan Bedford Forrest. Not taking her off the He was, he it was. It keeps going out. He was a uh, cavalry officer in the Civil War. They said he never lost a battle. But I don't know myself if he did or not. Okay. Can, can you read that? Is that a yes or a no? That was a yes. Okay. Next picture. That's not the next picture. Because you're going back. You want to go this well, way. I know, but that one. I thought there was another. Can you read that? Yes. OK. That is not the clan that came to Vermont, not that first one, because it, it became a terrorist thing. It's not on here. In 1915, Another clan was formed by Joseph Simmons. Can you read all that? Yeah. Yep. Born in 1880, died in 1945. He wanted it to be a fraternal organization. And when he saw that it was becoming prejudiced, he got away from it. In 1924, he sold it to Hiram Evans. But Hiram Evans didn't want it to be a fraternal organization. He wanted it to be a money-making thing. Okay. Right. And you have read this now. Why was it accepted? 
Before you go on, would you talk about how they thought it would be a money-making organization? They were charging admission. Not a lot, ten dollars a person, but that's, as far as I know, that's the way it was done. The purpose of it is here. You can read that. Okay. Don't change it so fast. Give us a chance to read it. Yeah, please. Thank you. Now, how did I get involved in it? I grew up in Oklahoma. And uh, when I got out of high school, I went down to Texas, and they had an Air Force base there, and my husband was there as an airman. I met him, and uh, we got married 70 years ago, and uh, he was from Vermont. He was born in Berlin. I liked him a lot, and I liked Vermont a lot, so here I am. <laughs> But I was surprised when we were looking at his mother-in-law's pictures and I saw this big long picture with Ku Klux Klan people in it. And I said, what is this? And she said, well, that's me right there. Thank you. She, is, she said, I'll show a big one. There'll be a big picture of it on the screen in a minute. Okay, good. Okay. So I questioned her about it. She said, oh, it was just a good time. It was a picnic and prayer and singing, just having a good time, and burning a cross. That was fun. <laughs> but how many of you like a bonfire? <laughs> They went to schools and gave the kids flags and different things. Unless they were Irish Catholic. In 1970, I took a Vermont history course because I've always been interested in history. And Charlie Morrissey was going to do a history course on Vermont history. So I started in and he said, Everybody has to do a project, a history project. And I went to him and I said, uh, how about if I do it on the Ku Klux Klan? And he about fell off his stool. <laughs> he said, it's never been done. So, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> so, where would I go to find material on the Ku Klux Klan? Where would you go if you were going to find it? Vermont Historical Society? The newspapers. You got it. Newspapers. The, the Historical Society had nothing. But every day in the newspaper, and they were easy to find, there was KKK headlines almost every day in the newspaper. So that's where I got a lot of my material, and I got a lot of it from personal interviews. I had a friend about that time who had bought a, new, a different house, and she said she found in the attic some Ku Klux Klan material, some robes and some hoods, and um, if you see the big banner that says Montpelier Women here somewhere. It's with blue on the table. And, uh, I'll get it. But we'll see it later in the pictures. And uh, <clears throat> so I asked her, I said, could I take those to my class to show the teacher? Guess what I got for a grade? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. He liked it. So, so we got all the things and took them to my class. Okay, are you familiar with this house in Montpelier? 
It's on Liberty Street. And it didn't look like this in 1920. It didn't have that top part on it. But this is where Edwin and Emma Nichols lived. And they were the head of the clan. She was the head of the women. He was the head of the men. I asked her if Charlie Nichols, our former mayor, was uh, their child, but she didn't know. I don't think they had children. Well, she was them. older. She was 43 when she married him. But I didn't find any children for them. These are some things that were found in East Montpelier. And when I published my book, people started finding things all over the place. And the Vermont Historical Society has a, getting a pretty good collection of things. So when did you publish your book? What year? In uh, 87. Here are some newspaper items that I found. Cross burning in Barnard, a big gathering in Shaw's Field, 600 to 1,000, I don't know if that's cars or people, but there were a lot of people. And the bottom is later Crawford's Auto World Land. Do you remember the, that in Bethel? Crawford's Auto Place. <laughs> How were they? How were the articles presented? Was it just straight, straight news coverage, or was it expose? They were kind of against it. <laughs> most of them. Most of them were against it. Um, here's more items. There were 150 Klansmen that met in Windsor. Can, you can read all that, right? Yeah. Give them a minute. Can you see it, Mary? Yep. That's okay. The last one is a cross was burned on the Catholic Church steps. That brought a lot of attention because two men were arrested that did that. And they were getting ready to have you have a question? Yes, if they were Protestant, why did they burn crosses? Why not? <laughs> it was a good luck plan. They always burn crosses. I don't know why. Um, I don't know how that developed. What and, and I couldn't period, find out. What time period now are we talking about? 1920s. Okay. Then that's all. All right. Well, my grandmother told me that when she was a little girl living in Moortown, uh, as an Irish Catholic, she was told not to go near the encampment, which was down on the Mad River, oh. right below Moortown Village. That's uh, right. They were they were stealing children. Oh, oh well. Okay, we'll have time for comments and and the questions later. All all day if we want to, but I wanted to tell you about these two men that were arrested in at the Catholic Church. They were getting ready to have a trial for them, but they never did. They finally had to, to just not do it. But the lawyer that was going to defend these two guys was named Dean Davis. Oh. Oh, wow. Who was that? <coughs> Governor of the Vermont state of Vermont later. And here's some more. A lot of of them. And the last one is Weston's Trailer Park. Oh, oh gosh. Yeah. Do you know where that is? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know Ken Weston? Well. He lived right there. His wife was a herring. And um, the head of the women of the clan in Montpelier was Emma Herring. And she was uh, a cousin of Ken Weston's wife. So I expect that Ken Weston was in it too. I don't know. But they did things in his, in his uh, field. And this is a place on the hill where that picture of the big group was made. 
You familiar with that? What is that in Berlin? It's uh, in Montpelier, Town Hill. Uh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, we'll see more about the, the parade. And uh, so my mother-in-law told me things. Now here's another personal contact I had. Ethel Bailey. Any of you know Cliff Bailey? Barry. Yeah. He's a big businessman over there. His wife told me wow. a personal story. She said, my brother was in the Klan, but I didn't know it. But he and his wife took my little boy swimming one day. They all drowned because they got swept into deep water. And when they had the funeral, they were in their gowns, their clan gowns. That's the first I knew that my brother was a member. And you ever hear of Dr. Corson? Corson? Corson in Plainfield? No. He arranged the funeral for these people. Said when they marched around the, the grave, they were throwing flowers into the grave. Throwing because what? Flowers. They were throwing flowers into the grave uh -huh. because these were their friends, their their clan people. Okay. Another uh, personal contact I had was with a woman that lived downtown, up above. Summer's Hardware Store in those apartments. They lived up there and she had a little boy and she made him a robe so he could go with them to the meetings. And she told of one night, there were seven crosses burned around town. And uh, you see the list of them there. She didn't remember all of them, but said they really enjoyed looking out and seeing the people on the street being really startled by all this. Now, this is a Klan outing of some Northfield Klan's women. And uh, the woman on the, on the right, as you look at it, is uh, my husband's grandmother. And the next one was his mother and two other people from Northfield. They went to Smuggler's Notch for a picnic. Now, doesn't that sound like fun? <laughs> How many of you have been to Smuggler's Notch for a picnic? <laughs> and here's some other members from Northfield. Mrs. Whitney, her husband was uh, ran the Northfield News. You can read the names of these people. So they were all... Most of the people who were in the Klan were upstanding, reputable people, like newspaper editors, preachers. They had a lot of uh, meetings all over the state. The big event they had was the parade, and that was in 1927, July the 4th. Why not have a big parade? This paper is printed and it's laying on the table. You might want to read it. I'm not going to try to read the whole thing to you. But it describes that parade, and this is the, the area where it was. Can you go back to that for a minute so we can A little longer. Could you go back so people can read it a little bit longer? Oh, the whole thing? Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you take the paper over there and read it, well, it's easier for us. To probably take less time. People like sitting down and seeing it in big letters. I know. I shouldn't have put that in there. <laughs> this. They say there was fifteen to twenty thousand people in town that day. And here's the, the head leader of the parade. I would guess that that is Edwin Nichols, the head of the Montpelier clan. 
and that is the Montpelier clan's women. And Lewis's aunt is kneeling down in the front row, the second from the right. That's his aunt. And she lived in Montpelier. Carrie Warren. Uh, Clara. Clara. Oh. Yeah, her name is Clara Warren. Hard to see it from here. Yeah, <laughs> but Carrie Warren was her mother. And uh, this is the Berry clan. You see their banner? And this is the Montpelier. No, this is the Northfield. Northfield, and Lewis's mother is standing behind the flag on the right end. That's Lewis's mother, uh, Laura. And she would have been about 27 years old. And she got married later that year. The Randolph clan. And these are all in that big long picture, but I, I chopped them up because the only way I could get them into a picture like this. And this is the Boston Tea Party clan. A group came up from Boston for the big 4th of July celebration in Montpelier, Vermont. And this is the area where it was on, on Town Hill. Do you remember where Town Hill is? Yeah. Yeah. You go out very out Main Street to Port East Montpelier. Used to be the Juliana's house. No. Um, I'll tell you, it, it used to be a, a airplane landing field. And uh, in 1927, when they had the flood here, uh, the bakery was running out of yeast, and airplanes were dropping yeast up on the hill so they could continue their bakery. <laughs> what? Were they making hot cross buns? Yes. <laughs> They, they did make it. My husband worked there for 10 years. <laughs> the clan, but the clan by this time is getting a bad reputation. So they were beginning to fold up their things and hide them and deny they were ever in it. By 1930, the clan was totally disbanded. You can read that. When I was doing my history project, a lot of younger people, which would be my age and yours, didn't know that it had ever been here. Would you have known it had been here? Mary Alice did. Not my, but my grandmother was much older, so she must have been in the 1900s. Yeah. They had, well, uh, they had, uh, I would just bet you that a lot of your grandmothers were in it. <laughs> well, some of us will have Irish Catholic in the background, so the, I don't think that would have mattered. Some are Jewish. <laughs> now, this changes the whole subject right here. The witness stump. My husband was working on the neighbor's garage, and he saw this thing and mentioned to her that I had been doing Ku Klux Klan work because down in the corner it has a KKK 32. And she gave it to him. And up in the corner, in the right-hand corner, with a pencil had been written, and it was so dim I could hardly see it. I had to use a magnifying glass to see it. It said, Stan Olin, Chicago, Illinois. Well, I'm a genealogist, so what do I have to do? I had to find him. So I went to the 1920 census, also the 1910, and the 1930. You can see it better in the 1930. Uh, that the fourth person down, Daniel Olin. He was born in Finland. His wife, Alma, was born in Sweden. And they have two boys, Stanley and Clifford. Here he is in the census in Illinois. I don't know if he came to Vermont and wrote his name on this witness stamp, or if he wrote it there and then it got brought here. 
so I didn't find out that much about him, but I did look up a lot what of his. A, what is a witness? I, I, that we did not find out. Oh. I don't know. It wasn't included in any amount of plan research, but because it, said, because it said KKK down on yeah. the bottom, I wanted to put it in my, my story. Well, I did my research with Charlie Morrissey, and at the end of the, the course, I just placed my manuscript in the Historical Society. And uh, it, it stayed there until 1987. It's the end of the slideshow, but I have a lot more stuff to tell you about. <laughs> okay. I have a, a newspaper article from the Hardwick Gazette. February 8th. 1923. So 1923 is when it was starting up in Vermont. And here's what the Gazette said. A Ku Klux Klan organizer, George P. Mason by name, is due to make an attempt to start something in Vermont soon. He is now already talking it up in New Hampshire and has told people in that state that he plans to organize clans all through New England and eventually controlled the public offices. Last week, he invaded the New Hampshire legislature where it is claimed that he enrolled membership of 20 legislators in this organization. Forewarned is forearmed. If Vermont is on the lookout for him, it may be better prepared to meet the situation when it arrives. So, this is kind of warning, they're, they're coming. I want to tell you some more about um, Edwin Nichols and Emma Nichols that, that lived on Liberty Street in Montpelier. Her maiden name was Herring, and there was a lot of Herrings. And there's, any of you related to Herrings? There are a lot of them around. A lot in Berlin. A lot of them in Berlin, and there was a lot in, in, in Moortown at that time. And um, Emma Herring's father was named Charles Herring, and he was from Berlin. He was in the Civil War, and uh, he got wounded. He was shot. And he had a brother, Selden, that was with him there, and he put him on a ret retreating cannon. Then he put him on an ambulance, and then he put him on a baggage wagon, so he managed to save his brother. And uh, Charles had a brother, William. He was the father of Ken Weston's wife. So I prepared a little herring genealogy here. Okay, another incident that I found was in South Barry. A friend of mine, uh, well, two friends of mine, Don Camp. Ever heard of Don Camp? He had a farm in South Barry. Camp Street. Maybe. Well, Camp Street is where all the granite oh. manufacturing owners live. Well, anyway, he, um, he was a member of the, the Klan, and another friend was a member of the Grange, and they made a deal. If you'll join the Grange, I'll join the Klan. Oh. So they did. Well, this friend of mine that was telling me about it said, well, I was really a, a joiner, so I got involved and I became an officer. They gave me a, a special collar to wear when I'm officiating in the, in the office there. But one day I went to a meeting. There was a strange woman there from New Hampshire, and she said, I've got to talk to you. I understand you're harboring Jews. <laughs> what would that mean? And my friend said, my Irish temper took off. I threw my robe down, and I threw the collar down, and I stomped out of there, and I never went back. 
and said they followed me to the door trying to beg me to stay. Well, the story of the Jew was that there was a, a woman in the community who had had a little illegitimate child uh, in the past, and then she soon married a man who was a Jew. So that man who was a Jew sort of raised her little boy with her. So he might have appeared to be a Jew, but he wasn't. And when that little boy grew up, he married and had a little boy. Well, neither one of them were Jews. His wife died, and he needed someone to take care of the little boy while he worked. And my friend was taking care of him. So that's why they accused her of harboring Jews. But she would have anyway. She was the kind of person that would help anybody. She didn't want to be against anybody. Another case, did you ever hear of Cliff Bailey in Barrie? He had a wife, Ethel Bailey, and she's the one that said that her brother was in the Klan. I guess I told you all about that. But Dr. Corson prepared the funeral. So at the end of the three-month class, I wrote my paper, left it at the Historical Society, and during the time it was there, over 10 years, people were coming to me from all kinds of places. One came from Maine, had a picture just like mine, made the same day. His was number one, mine's number four. So I'm sure there's more of those in somebody's attic around. Now, Pat Shepard is a lady from Topsom. And she wrote to me and said, my mother has a bunch of Klan stuff here. She doesn't really want it or know anything about it. Would you like to see it? So we went over to see it, and she ended up giving it to me. And uh, I think there's a picture over there somewhere of all the stuff. It, it was a little pocket knife that said KKK on it. And there was robes, and there was pamphlets, and uh, she gave all those to me. And I gave them to the Vermont Historical Society. And you see this? The book standing here on the end is called Vermont Century Book. It's the 200th anniversary of statehood. And the section in the, and it's kind of laid out every 10 years. The section on the 1920s has the picture of, the big plan picture. Okay, one more character here. Karen Hess was an author. She wrote children's books. And uh, here's what she had to say later on. She said, in 1997, while returning from a speaking engagement, I spent the last minutes of my flight skimming the airline magazine. I came across a short piece about the Ku Klux Klan in Vermont in the 1920s. I read the item, shaking my head in disbelief. Back home, I wasted no time in attempting to disprove the article. But to my surprise, it was correct. I read Maudine Neal's book about the Klan in Vermont. I wrote to her about her research and tried to imagine how I might take this episode in history and craft a compelling story from it. Well, she did write a story about it, and it's over there, a book called Witness. She, uh, she wrote the book, and uh, shortly after that, they, in 2003, Vermont had a program. I don't know if they do it every year, but it was called Vermont Reads. You ever hear of that? Yeah. Every, every town, or school at least, wanted to read the same book that year. In 1923, the book they wanted to read was Witness. Oh, 1923? 2000. 2000. 2000. Oh, wake me up. 
two thousand. Is that the one called? Two thousand three. Different points of view. Pardon? Is that the book where different people talk from different points of view? Maybe. Uh, it, it, she wrote it as a play, okay. and okay. in Northfield she had it performed, and when she chose the people to be the performers, she chose people that had the same background, like. Um, Claudine, I have a question. Okay. You talked about your mother-in-law um, described what the KKK was for her with the social. That's right. So, uh, but they did do all the cross branding. So how many did it evolve from kind of an in innocent, in Vermont, did it evolve from kind of an innocent social event to, to the darker side? Or was that always there and some people either I, I think it ignored was, it or didn't know about it? They didn't know. Like my friend in South Barry, who was accused of harboring Jews, she didn't know she wasn't supposed to harbor a Jew. And, and really, she wasn't. And you came from Oklahoma, so you actually knew the Ku Klux Klan was a pretty terrible organization. I, I knew to stay away from it. <clears throat> well, my father's people came from Georgia and South Carolina. And they came to Oklahoma in the 1920s, and that's when it was pretty active down there. But do you have any information about when it started over in New Hampshire? Because the people that were bothering my grandmother were coming from New Hampshire and camping out over here in probably the 19 the end of the. The 19th century. I, I think it would have probably been. Um, Joseph Simmons started this clan in 1915 in uh, Georgia, and it spread all over the country. So it, it well, came. My to, grandmother was born in the, in the uh, 1800s, so I think it had started in New Hampshire long before. Well, the first clan might have been. It was, I don't think it was up here, though. It was more in the south. But 1915 is when Joseph Simmons started this clan. And, um, in Georgia, and then it spread all over, right? That's right. OK. Well, I think. Tell them about finding some of the robes in the houses in Montpelier, the story you told me when we got together. People had them in their attics. I did. Yeah. I did oh, include that, didn't I? I thought there was another one. Cause didn't the picture you got of the women of uh, the Ku Klux Klan? Women? You know that picture of the banner? I mean, didn't you have some that the woman wanted to sell and she took them back? Okay, sorry. I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, but that's the end of my research. But I want to read something to you. Okay, this is by Marvin Neumuller, a German theologian. He said, first they came for the socialist, then they came for the trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews. In each instance, I did not speak out, as I was not one of them. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. So people had questions, and I'm going to help Maydean. Uh, Who has heard this respond? before? <laughs> but I think I think it kind of describes the Klan. You know, either you. You know what you're getting into or you don't. Okay. And a first question on the blue. Can you tell me what Ku Klux Klan means? What the words? Ku Klux means circle. Klan was taken from the Scottish clans, and people who were, had a common interest. So Ku Klux clans. And they called it Ku Klux Klan. Thank you. 
back of a Cape Cod sweatshirt. So I'm curious, um, were most people in Vermont in the plan like your mother-in-law there for a social gathering and did, weren't aware of the hatred behind it? That's right. That's exactly right. It was the man that did all the work. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, even the men didn't know right off what it was. Black, okay. black and white. Um, in the early 1980s, I worked in Middlebury with a woman who had grown up on Route 7 in East Middlebury. She was born in 1921. And one of her earliest memories was seeing a cross burning out her bedroom window on a hill. <laughs> and we had a conversation about how beautiful she thought it was because she, oh. she was so little. She didn't know what it was about. And having to switch her mind, she didn't learn what it was about until she said after she got out of high school and someone explained to her what that was about. Yeah. And how she had to switch her mind from this beautiful image in her head of this gold, fiery thing um, to what it really meant. It was a conversation I'll never forget. That's, that's the way it was. It was a beautiful thing. I like to see a fire, a bonfire. Probably enjoy seeing a cross. Can you tell about instances of violence that you learned about? Not really. Well, you no. talked about the fires all over Montpelier. Yeah, the, the, the cross burnings, but those weren't violent. They were, like the girl said, pretty. Uh, but there was a case in Burlington where two men broke into the Catholic Church and stole some artifacts, and they were found. And uh, that wasn't really violence, but it was mischief. So I, I think a lot of them were. I had heard that when they came to Montpelier, that it was the mayor or it was somebody high up in the in the uh, Montpelier city government, and that's why they never took them to court. But you know, there is another side of the story. All the victims and the people that had to deal with this hatred. They, they, there were Irish Catholics. There were French Catholics. Those churches. All that you didn't do any research with the people who were victims. No. I didn't. I just had what was it? These, what I said was in the newspapers. This was just a less than a year course, and she was also raising a family, so she did more research than anybody's done. But uh, it's hardly as exhaustive as it might be. Uh, but the resources are limited. Um, yeah, but they, the, they really didn't talk about the victims in the news. No, the newspapers wouldn't wouldn't talk about. Uh, no, but there must be several people in the community who remember from the Catholic and the Jewish side what it was like living here in those days when you had all the wasps against you. Hey, there's a, something for you to look up. Yeah. <laughs> Find out and tell us about it. And time is short, right? All those people are... Well, a lot of them are dead. I mean, uh, I have a friend who's great for his wife's great aunt was a, a member of the Klan. And not only was it a social club, according to this person, but it also was a Christian. It had a very strong Christian component to it. Yeah. And, and, and she joined and really loved all the festivities and the fire, probably. Yeah. But then other people said, oh, this is a terrible organization. What are you doing being a member? And so they quit. So, yeah. But it gets harder and harder to have those recollections because those people are all dead now. I mean, May Dean at least talked to some people when she did her research. I, I did. Seven uh, that were yeah. in, either in it or their parents were in it, or yeah. their relatives. Yes. OK. Purple. Uh, the prejudice didn't just start with the plane. I had ancestors that were Irish Catholic in New York in the 1900s, and there were signs in all, this, all the buildings. Mm -hmm. Catholics, you know, Irish, Irish. Yeah. 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 So the Klan picked 
The undercurrent of racism is like yeah. oh. Did you ever hear the term wasp? Wasp. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sure. What does wasp stand for? White, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. White Anglo-Saxon Protestant. That's what the Klan was. Yeah. But it's really hard when you did a family, as I was, growing up with, with um, Yankees that had been here since 1634 on my father's side, and my mother was an Irish Catholic. So I got both sides. <laughs> my father was, my grandfather was Mason, and I think the Masons had something to do with yeah. Well, the Masons uh, were also a very right. elitist organization. Purple shirts. Sure. Yeah, one of the interesting things about your story is you, you said that the, the group here in Montpelier had their picture taken in front of the Catholic Church. And that surprised me because I thought they didn't like Catholics, right? Oh, I didn't say they had pictures in front. I said they they burned a cross oh, on the steps at the Catholic Church. She said they did it up on Hill Street, up, up, yeah. up on um, what I think might be at the Giuliani. Yeah. But they did it right on the steps of the church, and nobody would do anything because they were all people who were highly up in the government. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> And they said that the mark on the Catholic Church stayed there. It, they couldn't get it off. Any other questions from someone other than Mary Alice? <laughs> <laughs> I would just like to comment that I think we have to be aware that we're living through a time now where there are some groups, right? the Proud Boys and some of these others. Oath Keepers just went on trial. Pardon? Oath Keepers, the president of the Oath Keepers. And trial we're seeing the same kind of prejudice stirred up yeah. uh, that we did then. So I think we all have to be aware that it's around us and speak out against it. Absolutely. Yeah, that's why I read this. That's why I read this for you. Yes. If there are no more questions, I'm going to try and have somebody help us get this um, Screen up so you can try it and he wasn't. You can come and look at all of these things as long as you want to. Otherwise, we should want me to be on the other side. <laughs> Whatever. It's not going up there. I'd like to say one more thing. That's why we